Hi, everyone. Good morning. See, we have a few already here. Welcome. Good morning, everyone. Happy Tuesday. Welcome to Indian Grinding Rock. So I have about a few of you here. So I'm going to give it just a little while longer. So we have a few more um, attendees showing up. And I want to welcome you all today on this pretty cold morning here at Indian Grinding Rock State Historic Park. It's about 30 degrees. It'll warm up just a little bit later, but we definitely have a lot of frost this morning. I'm located in the foothills of the Sierra Nevada mountain range. And today we're going to talk about the different seasons here in the Sierra Nevada foothills and how the Miwok people would adapt their life to because of those different seasons, because of the changes that these seasons brought to this area. So I'm going to turn my camera. I'm going to step out of the view, actually. And you can see that I'm in a wooded area. You see a lot of trees around you. And I'll show you on a map in just a minute where I am. But today we're gonna to be talking about the Miwok culture, the indigenous Miwok culture and how they survived in this area for thousands and thousands of years up until around 170 years ago when settlers started to arrive in this location. But for thousands and thousands of years, the Miwok and other Sierra native communities, they use the natural resources around them as a basis for their everyday life. So I'm gonna see, all right. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen so you can get an idea of where I'm at. So I know my screen turned, no big deal. Don't worry about that. But I'll show you a couple different maps right now. So this first map, you're gonna be able to see the different native regions in California and the different native um, tribes that exist throughout the state of California. Now I have some, work for you to do. I want you to go ahead and see if you can find Sierra Miwok on the map. If you find Sierra Miwok, go ahead and raise your hand. All right, I see one person has found it. Can we get some more? Look for Sierra Miwok. Miwok is spelled W-O-K. And that's the region that I'm in for this presentation. So if you're having any difficulty, I'll go ahead and circle it for you. So Sierra Miwok is right there. But you can see that California has many different Native American groups all throughout the state. And each of those groups would use the different natural resources around them. So we'll talk about what the Sierra Miwok would use. Here's another map and I want you to find where Indian Grinding Rock is on this image. You see it? Should be easier to find. So you can see the park right there, right above the Central Valley of California. And even though I'm in the Sierra Nevada mountain range, I'm not at the very top. Here's the top of the mountain range. I'm not at the top, I'm a lot lower in this region. So the weather is a lot more mild, perfect for plant life, animal life. I'm gonna go ahead and erase that and I'm gonna stop sharing. And let's talk about this park for a minute. So this park is called Indian Grinding Rock and it was developed as a state park and preserved as a state park because of the importance um, that it, it helps to protect the Miwok culture. And I'll show you what I mean by that in just a moment. But this site was used as a Miwok village for thousands and thousands of years, not just for the Miwok people, but also for other Sierra native groups as well. And the name of the park is Indian Grinding Rock. So we'll talk about the Grinding Rock in just a minute. But first let's begin by talking about the different seasons. So right now we're in autumn. And autumn here at the park is incredibly beautiful. Some of the trees here change color and we have the seasonal creek is running and it's filled with different types of animal life here during fall. But the most important thing about fall is that during the fall time, something falls from these trees that the Miwok would rely on for food. Something falls from the oak trees. Raise your hand if you think you know what that could be. What might fall from the oak trees that all native California groups would, would use? About All right, a few of you think you know, about 14 of you think you have an idea. Well, I'm gonna hold it up to you 
because I have an example of them. And I'm gonna show it to you. I'm gonna hold it up to the camera. So during um, fall, September, October, November, these drop from the trees. Do you know what this is? Raise your hand if you know. So these are acorns. And there's a wide variety of acorns here. And acorns were very, very important for the Miwoks. Acorns were actually the number one food source. Out of all the plant life and all the animal life, acorns were the number one food source. Have any of you ever eaten an acorn, anything made out of acorn before? Raise your hand if you have. Okay, a few of you have. Well, for the acorns, the acorns would need to be cracked. And so during fall, everyone helped to collect the acorns. It was an acorn gathering. It was a harvest here. And that was your main food source. So for the women, they had a very important role. The women would help to process these acorns. Because if you just found an acorn, they wouldn't just be able to eat it. They'd have to crack the acorn and then pound the acorn, then leach the acorn with water to get rid of the bitter taste. So it was quite a process. And in order to do that, they needed to pound the acorns on something hard. Raise your hand if you think you know something hard that they could use. All right, someone named Sebastian. I think he was the first person to have his hand up. So let's see if you're right. I'm gonna hold it out to you right now. Let's see what they would use. What's hard enough? Well, a rock is definitely hard enough for the women to pound the acorns on. Did you get it right? Raise your hand if that's what you guessed. So this is an individual grinding rock, which means this grinding rock was used by one woman throughout her lifetime. And if you look inside of this grinding rock, you can see this very, very deep hole. Raise your hand if you think this hole has always been on the rock. Raise your hand if you think it was made by a native woman over time. Very good. So over around 15 of you got that one right. Good. So it was made over time. So after the acorns were rinsed with water and then dried out, then they could be pounded. And in order to do that, they would take another rock and pound on top of the rock. Eventually, that acorn is going to be kind of like a flower as it's pounded and grinded up. And that flour can be used to make breads and cakes and also acorn soup as well. So acorns are very, very, very important. And this grinding rock isn't very heavy, fits in the palm of my hand, so it can be carried around, which is very convenient. Well, here at the park, park's name is Indian Grinding Rock, which tells us that there's a grinding rock here. Raise your hand if you think this is the grinding rock at the park, the biggest grinding rock at the park. Raise your hand if you think there has to be a bigger grinding rock here. You're right, there is a bigger grinding rock and I'm going to show you a photo of it. Since it's, well, I'll show you where it's located in just a minute. My screen's gonna turn, don't be alarmed. And I'm gonna bring up some photos of this grinding rock. And you're right, this grinding rock is much larger than the little rock that I'm holding. So you should be able to see this photo soon. Raise your hand if you can see the picture. Perfect. All right, now you're looking at the grinding rock here at the park. And this grinding rock is huge. And unlike the one that I showed you, this grinding rock is flat. It's this big flat slab of rock. Raise your hand if you notice lots of holes. Yeah, that's the first thing you instantly notice. And if you look closely, some holes are really deep. I'll circle some for you to see. So some are very deep, even deeper than that one. And pretty wide as well. And others are very shallow. So they, these holes were made over time by, what do you think? Raise your hand if you think only a few Native women made these holes. Raise your hand if you think many women working together made these holes over time. Very, very good. Yep, about 20 of you think that. So these holes were made over thousands and thousands of years. 
the oldest hole is around 8,000 years old. So that means that this area that I'm standing in has been used by different native people for at least 8,000 years. And all these holes tell us that this was a very important site. This is the place where people gathered and worked, processed the acorns for food. So just imagine all of these women working together, grinding seeds and acorns on this rock. And that's how all of those holes were made. Well, today the grinding rock is protected by a fence that goes all the way around it. And that's because we don't want anyone to walk on this rock. That would be seen as disrespectful. So that's how we protect the rock. Here's another photo of it you can see. This one I took last week after the rains. And if you look, you'll see lots of leaves in the holes. So that tells you that this photo is definitely taken during the fall as all the leaves are falling to the ground. And then here's another one that I have as well. So circle, holes as far as the eye can see. Big grinding rock. It's actually the biggest grinding rock in North America. So it's very, very important. All right. I'm going to stop sharing. So we learned a little bit about how important autumn was because that's when the acorns are falling. So they would harvest and gather and they needed to prepare for the winter because winter would change the landscape. I'm going to go ahead and take us now into the museum and we're going to talk about winter here. But before I do that, I'm going to show you a photo of fall in the park and winter in the park. So let me go ahead and find my photos. All right. So this first one that you're looking at, raise your hand if you see some structures. Kind of look like tents. Good. What could those be made out of? So think about that for a second. What could those possibly be made out of? You'll also notice in this photo, you can see some of the trees in the background that have changed color. Some are uh, yellow even. So that's an example of fall in the park. And those structures that you see, those are called yumachas or they're bark houses. That's what the Miwok people would live in during the cold seasons, fall and especially winter. This next photo that I'm showing you is of the park during winter time. And you'll see all the snow. Hold on just one second, everyone. All right, so you're looking right now at the photo of winter here at the park. And you can see a lot of snow. So that's what the park looks like when the snow comes down. And it can come down pretty thick. And you can see the land is just covered in snow. Raise your hand if you can see the water. You see some water trickling in? Very, very good. So it's absolutely beautiful in winter. But winter here, Pose some challenges, all that snow, very, very cold. And think about the animals that the Miwok would depend on. Well, those animals aren't gonna be um, around as frequently. Some of them are gonna be hibernating or going further south. So winter posed different challenges. So let's talk about how the Miwoks would live during winter. So I'm gonna stop sharing and turn my screen. And right now you're looking at the bark house or the Yumacha. So here's an up close look. You saw the picture of the Yumachas in the park. Well, here's the one in the museum. And so these bark houses are obviously made with bark from the trees. They're um, also supported by cedar poles wrapped in grapevines. And the ones that the picture that I showed you, if you walk inside of those, you'll see that they can stay very warm and very dry, which is important because we know that it does rain here. It does snow here. So these would be the homes in wintertime. And in order to keep warm, what do you think they'd have in the center of these Yumachas? Raise your hand if you think you know. What would be in the center for warmth? Well, today a lot of us have maybe a heater to keep warm in winter, but then they would use fire. So they would have a little fire burning in the center for warmth, also for cooking. And the smoke from the fire would go up through the top. And that would keep the Yumacha nice and warm. 
the ground would be lined with pine needles to create a bedding. And raise your hand if, as you're looking at this Yuma Chow, raise your hand if you see something that can be used for warmth. What can be used for warmth? All right, you might be looking at this big deer hide right here that could be used for warmth. Very, very important. It could be used for clothing, blankets, also a door covering as well to not let the cold wind inside. You can see around the sign, uh, the side, we have some other animal skins. So we have a rabbit skin, a raccoon skin. Down here in this basket, we have a fox skin and a bobcat skin. So different fur from different animals used to make clothing to keep warm. Very important during the winter as things start to slow down. Now those acorns that we mentioned that were very important during the winter time, before the first, the first rains of winter begin, the acorns are already stored. And this is an acorn granary. So this can store up to 2,000 pounds of acorns and it's lined with grape vines and pine needles and other types of plants. And it has to be protected from certain animals that really like acorns, especially during you know, winter time as they start getting hungry. Raise your hand if you can name at least one animal that really likes the acorns. Good, are you thinking squirrels? Yep, so squirrels and worms and other insects. Very, very good. So important to keep the acorn supply safe for the entire winter season. Very, very important since there is less food available. Down here, you can see some different types of tools. So we have deer antlers. We'll talk about deer a little bit later. You can see some rocks used for cooking. And during the winter time, as more of the men and women find themselves inside, doing work inside the Yumacha so that they stay warm, some of the things that they would work on would be to make spears, like this one that you see used for fishing or they could also make repairs to their bows and arrows. But they would also make, I'll take you over here so you can see inside. They would also make baskets. You can see many baskets here in this wall. Baskets were very, very important, made from different plants. You see at the very top, two really large baskets. Those would be used for cooking. Those are cooking baskets and you can see the different patterns on them as well. So basket making is incredibly important. These cone baskets, they look like kind of like ice cream cones. These are called burden baskets and they would be used to collect the acorns. So the women would use these baskets. Now you can see that there are different patterns on them. Each one has a different pattern. Some of these really big cooking baskets could take about a year to make. So it was a long process. Down here, you can see another large cooking basket. And the way they could cook is they would, if you can see those little rocks, raise your hand if you see those tiny three little rocks right there. So those rocks would be heated over fire, dropped into the acorn mixture. Then they would be stirred using like these wooden cooking pad paddles. And they'd have to be stirred quickly, those rocks, so that they wouldn't burn the outside of the basket. So very, very important, basket making. So a lot of that could be done uh, during the winter seasons as there's less traveling, trying to stay warm closer to, closer to home. Over here, we have a large mur mural of a trading site a few hours away used during, well, this painting was taken probably in the springtime. So I'm gonna talk really quickly about, about winter travel. Um, get the okay. I'm gonna talk really quickly about winter travel. So during the winter time, you still had to go somewhere to travel somewhere, you can see what would be used for that. So I'm holding up here, something very important during the winter that could be used. Raise your hand if you think you know what these could be used for. 
So some, some people, some students, guess that these could be used as a Frisbee or a dream catcher. No, I think winter. So these were used as snowshoes. Not by the Miwok, but by the Maidu, which is another Sierra Nevada um, tribe. And so for crossing in winter, these snowshoes would be wrapped around boots. So they would wear um, boots made out of different animal furs like deer hide. And then these snowshoes help to, you know, keep your balance over the snow so that they wouldn't sink into the snow and get really cold and wet and help keep the balance. So that's one way that they could, you know, adapt to the different seasons. So right now I'm going to go ahead and take us outside. I'm going to pause for just a second. And we're going to move on to talk about the importance of spring and the different plants here. So we talked about fall and winter. And let's go ahead and talk about spring. But as I do that, I'm going to turn my camera. I'm going to share with you a photo of spring here at the park. So spring is a lot different than the other two seasons. So you're going to see two photos. Okay. So I'm going to turn my screen. And as I'm walking us outside, I just want you to take a close look at the park in springtime and think about what you notice. What color are the trees? What color is the grass? What's all on the rock? So I'm gonna mute myself just a second as you view the photo. All right, so raise your hand if you noticed a lot of green in this photo. Maybe you noticed the rain. Very, very good. So spring is very important. It brought new life here. The snow has thawed. The rain has fallen. And it's very green and very lush during the springtime as well. Here's another photo of one of the creeks here. So there are multiple seasonal creeks. And as it rains, and especially as the snow melts, these creeks start running and they start flowing. So spring is very, very important. Oh my gosh, are those deer? Mm -hmm. <gasps> so right now, as I walked outside, you're looking at a live view of the park. And remember, this is what the park looks like in fall. Well, I'm looking right now at the Yuma Chaws, the bark houses. And I can see over here something that I haven't seen this close in a while. And that's deer. So I can see deer walking around the Yumachas. And I can see deer. There's even a deer running on the grinding rock. Oh my gosh, how cool. Okay, so I'm gonna pause. I even see a little baby deer. So let's talk about springtime. And to talk about springtime, I'm gonna bring in my colleague and she's gonna talk about the different plants and what springtime represents. So I'm gonna set you up turn my screen and she'll go ahead and introduce herself. So. Good morning. So I'm Leticia and I've been with the state parks for a little over a year now. Um, so we're going to talk about some of the plants and the Creek and, and everything that goes on during the springtime. So for the springtime to happen, in a good way in this park. So every plant growing healthy and all the trees growing um, is a big, big deal. So we have four different types of oak trees here. So we have the black oak and then the, a couple of live oaks, you know, and we have a few plants that we use a lot and a lot of us still use these. So the oak trees are really important for us to get all the water and everything from the springtime and then the snow melts as well because the acorns is what, you know, used to hold us out for the winter time. So when all the snow and stuff happens, uh, we'd use the acorns to make like an oatmeal. You know, you can eat it hot or cold. Uh, you can have berries in it that grow naturally as well here at the park. There's still a lot of berries that grow. So 
with the acorns, we make what we call nupa. So like I said, you can eat it hot or cold. You can put berries in there. You can put some meats in there. It's all different. And there's some other ways you can cook it, like uh, bread. So since it's grinded up into like a flour, so it's fine, you can make bread out of that. So a lot of people think fry bread, but it's not the same. It, it tastes really different and the texture is a little different as well. It really does depend on who makes it. So that's one of the very important plants that we need to grow here, you know? So the rain and the snow, it really helps the plant. And here's another plant right here. This is the soap root plant. So you can see it's a bulb and it grows in the ground like this. Now during the rainy times, you'll be able to see the old ones. So the old bulbs, if they're not picked, you'll be able to see these tops and that's sticking out of the ground. Some of the bulbs get really big and others, they have multiple bulbs like this. So you're gonna have to wait for them to fully grow and then eventually the tops will die. And then they have seeds in them. So it's a long stem that comes out of the center of this. So the long stem, it has little white flowers on the top and eventually those are the seeds. So the seeds, the pods would open up and that's usually around the time you can start picking these. So you will use the digging sticks. So when you break it off into the ground, it'll move these, the bulbs. And then where the root comes from, usually you can drop the seeds down in the same place because it'll have some of these leftover fibers that you didn't get. So then it'll make a nice bed for the seeds that fall down. So with the soap root, it can be used as a lot of different things. The bottom of that bulb, if it's warmed up and scraped off, you'll get like a glue substance. So it's really thick and it's really slimy. So it's soap as well. So then you'll use it on the outside of the baskets. So that's able to hold water and other things like the acorns, you know, the when you're washing it, when you're taking the tannin out of it, then you can just put it in a basket like that and then do it as you cook. You can drop the hot rocks in a bigger basket with what we are gonna make was the nupa. And this, this one is a soap root brush. So this is entirely of the soap root plant. So here's those fibers. And this is the end of the bulb. So the root would have been down here. So you use the end of the bulb because it's easier after you take all the dirt chunks out and wash it out a little, then it's easier to use as a brush. So this brush was used to go down into the grinding rocks. So some of the holes are super deep. You'll take it and then you'll brush out your powder and then you put your powder in one of the baskets. And a couple other really important plants are gonna be these trees down here in our plant garden. So you can see right there, there's the red bud. You can see the leaves are kind of like a burgundy orange. And then over there, there's another tree. It's the buckeye. So those trees are super important to be nice and healthy because they're the basket trees. So the basket trees, it's a long process. It'll be around this time you'll be gathering them. So during the springtime, is when they're all gonna get nice and healthy and grow big stems. Um, I can't show you the willow from here, but the willow is super important because that's the main part of the baskets. A lot of the baskets here, the inside coil is the willow tree. So the long, long branches either growing straight up or they're falling down. Those are the parts that you're gonna need a lot of. So the buckeye and the redbud, you're going to strip down and that's going to hold your baskets together after you're wrapping them and feeding that through. But uh, without a lot of the creeks naturally flowing like they used to, a lot of the willow trees have died. So we only have probably about two year and they're not really maintained. So they got a lot of old 
branches that do need to be cut. It's just hard it being a state park to cut those and make them healthy again. But um, when the gold rush happened, they stopped a lot of the creeks. So all the natural flowing creeks that used to be here, they're gone. Uh, we only have one little stream and it appears that it ran all year this year. So that's a good thing for the random snow and rain. <laughs> so it was able to run all year and hopefully by next season, that rainwater and snow melt that came will help a lot of these plants, especially the willow trees that are next to that creek. All right. So we talked about fall and winter and spring and how important spring is. Well, let's talk about one more season. Raise your hand if you know the last season that we haven't mentioned yet. We've mentioned three out of four. So the last season is summer. So we're going to talk about how things change during the summertime. So I'm going to share with you a photo. I'm going to turn my screen again of the Yumachaws in summertime. So if you look at this picture right here, this one I took a couple summers ago. And raise your hand if you notice something different about, well, the grass that you saw in spring. What happened to it? What happened to those really lush leaves? Well, things dry over summer and summer would slow down the pace of life. More um, animal life has already started. Animals came out of hibernation, out of the cold during the winter. And so summer would be a season for hunting or fishing. Very, very hot here. It gets well into the close to 100 degrees some days. So these Yumachas that you saw, the winter homes, they wouldn't be used as often. During the summer, they would actually use these sun shelters. And you can see some right here. You can see how those are made out of wood, different sort of poles of trees. And that would bring, these homes are more airy. So you'd get an air source, It'll help you keep cool. So let's go talk about some of the different animals here and the animals that would be hunted and depended on. So one of the animals that was actually the number one meat source, I told you that I saw it today walking around the grounds. Do you remember what animal it was that I told you that I saw? Raise your hand if you remember. So it's an animal that made this track right here. And this is the deer, the mule deer. And from the mule deer, I want you to think about what could be created from the deer? So not just the meat, but what else could be used? We saw some things inside as we spoke about winter. Raise your hand if you remember clothing and blankets. Very, very good. So many different animals here in the winter, especially, or here in the summer. So animals like uh, ducks as well. There's that water source now before it dries up. There's animals like cottontail rabbits and here's the rabbit track there's animals like porcupines as well so many different animals and i wanted to show you an example of a bow and an arrow so i'm gonna will you talk about the bow and the milkweed okay so i'm gonna have uh, leticia talk to you about the bow and the arrow very very important for the hunters and remember in summer that's when they would hunt in the morning and then they would also hunt all the way through dusk Okay. Maybe just go ahead and talk. I don't think it's too loud. <laughs> okay. So here's a bow. A lot of them in the museum were recreated so that, you know, you had the opportunity to look at them. So oak tree would be used for the base because oak, when you get a young branch and you start to form it, it's actually super tough. It's like one of the toughest trees in woods to be able to use. So if you get a younger branch and you start to form it and able to connect your sinew or there's another part of a plant. So it's the inside of the milkweed. A lot of it's used to make the strings. So you can see that. So then you'll just tie it off in the end when the branch is young and then it'll keep this shape. So this one was recreated 
And I don't know, don't know what they use, but it's just the concept of us being able to show you and tell you some of the things that we used from it. So the best thing is to use the oak tree because it's going to be super strong. It's going to last a long time. And the strings and the sinew, you know, they're easier to come by because the back vein of the deer's leg, it can actually be stretched out after it's dried. So you'll wet it again and you'll keep stretching it. And then you'll have your string. And during the that? winter time, you hear during the winter time <laughs> hours, we actually use a lot more of the deer because as you can see, there was a lot more in the park. So a lot of them had babies recently again. So this is the time that we're able to hunt the deer more often. Uh, other things like beer, bears and stuff like that, they weren't hunted like that. Uh, maybe occasionally because uh, we have some bear dances, you know, some of the native people have bear dances and they actually really respect the bears. They don't go out hunt, hunting them in mass. So that's kind of why things were more at peace back then. Can you show really quickly again? Cause I don't think the kid, the people watching heard <laughs> cause my headphones were in. Can you talk about what that wood is? <laughs> okay. So it would have been an oak, oak, at a young age, so a younger branch and stripped down, it would have been best to use because it's super strong. Those trees are strong. And if you didn't hear, we're sorry. <laughs> we didn't know the headphones were still plugged in. And here is the arrow. So you can see the tip. This is, it's, it's obsidian and it's really sharp. So you can tell that it was chipped away on the ends. You gotta be very careful with it when you're doing it because you don't wanna shatter it. So it's finer than glass. So glass takes a couple hits, but if you hit these the wrong way, it'll mess up the whole tip. So it's done really well. And again, the shafts are gonna be out of the stronger branches. So like oaks and stuff like that. There was a couple of them who said they like to use uh, like the buckeye and the willow, but I don't think that was more for uh, hunting. I think it was more for a recreation. And these feathers, they're purple. So this one was down in our bottom room for when people showed kids how to make the bows and arrows. So this feather was probably colored on, but usually um, you'll see people when they remake them, they'll use turkey feathers. So you'll see like they're spotted white and black kind of. So there's the arrow. Also, there's an arrow for everything. So different types of animals. They weren't just traps. So there are arrows like this. This is a little floaty made of tule. So, when you switch your arrows, you'll go by for what you're hunting. So this one more likely be the mallards or the ducks, you know, and when they miss, this will stay on and in place and it won't go through all the way. And then it'll float if they missed. So there's that arrow. This one, it has a little jut in it. So a little piece of wood's kind of like sticking out of it. So you can see that it was tied with sinew here so that this piece didn't break off. So that would be more for the rabbits. So not only did we make traps for them, we also used the arrows for them too because the jackrabbits are super fast and we call them ep lollies. This one, this one has a stopper on it as well. And reason why this one has a stopper in it so it doesn't go through all the way. It's so that it doesn't ruin the feather of the birds. So quails, they had a specific trap because the quails, they like to run and hide when they feel they're in danger. So they'll go into the little bushes and everything. But things like this is easier to get some of the birds. Um, the woodpeckers and what, the flicker birds Traps were put over their homes and then they were scared out of the trees and then they flew into this long cone-like trap. 
and it has a bunch of holes in it from in between the materials. So when they try to get out, their wings would expand and get the feathers caught. So then you only pluck one to two feathers from the flicker birds. Alrighty. So, so with that, we learned about all four seasons. We talked about fall and the acorns, winter and the yumachas, and we talked about how fire would be used. In spring, we talked about the new plant life. And in summer, we talked about all the hunting and how they would hunt different animals using different types of arrows. So which season did you like learning about the most? Raise your hand if you liked um, the park in autumn. Who likes it in fall right now? Who liked it in winter, talking about winter and seeing that photo of the park covered in snow? What about any of you like spring when it's nice and green and really, really lush? And who likes talking about summer here at the park? All right, I think the last thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna have Letitia tell you about her favorite season in the park. So go ahead and come in, Letitia. So my favorite season of the park is actually gonna be spring. Springtime, when the COVID happened first, the whole park got shut down. So we closed the gates way up there. So all of the animals were able to come here and just roam freely without being bothered by anyone. So we had lots and lots of deers. We had a whole bunch of turkeys. We even had ducks. And I haven't seen ducks here in a super long time. So it was actually good to see a lot of the animals that weren't able to be here because there was a lot of people here. But that had to be my favorite season because they didn't cut the grass. They didn't trim the trees or clean the trails or anything. So it was a natural park and it was a great opportunity to be able to see no one else here but just the animals yeah. all righty all right thank you so much everyone for joining us today as we talked about the different seasons here at indian grinding rock state historic park thank you hopefully you're able to maybe come to this park and see it for yourself during any of those seasons in the future so thank you for joining us bye everyone thank you <laughs>